All right, guys, welcome to another week of the Educated Home Buyer Live, where Josh and I take your real estate and mortgage questions and answer them right here on the interwebs, along with giving you an update on what's happening with the economy, interest rates, everything, housing. So, Josh, the biggest issue right now is not mortgage rates. The biggest issue, buddy, is inventory. If inventory would increase, you could see some changes in the housing market. But fortunately, we're not seeing that, which you're going to see in the data. So, Josh, what should we start with this week? Jeb, I heard the biggest and most important thing, as our friend Kel M points out, that someone hit 100,000 subscribers on the YouTube. On the YouTube. 100,000 people wait patiently till you Ooh. post your weekly video so they can absorb the wisdom and insights and knowledge. I'm not sure that that's the case, but I did hit 100,000 subscribers. It's a goal accomplished. Um, and you guys that are listening are a huge part of that. So thank you guys. Thank you for the support over the last couple of years. And thank you for continuing to show up and answer, you know, ask questions so that Josh and I can, um, you know, uh, allow the wisdom to flow and create to, to educated flow. home buyers. Um, and that's essentially where we're at. So Josh, let's do as we always do and start this week off by looking at some charts. So we always like to start by looking at inventory because inventory typically tells the sign of what we're going to see in the housing market. And this week we saw inventory pretty much move flat, uh, very, very little change nationwide in inventory. But we're still above those numbers from last year, which is a positive sign at the moment. Uh, Orange County, we increased a little bit, sitting at 1,911 homes. Huntington Beach increased very little, 155. But again, we're not seeing the numbers go the other direction, which is which is a big thing. Um, and on the same, same token, which you'll see here in just a moment, we're not seeing huge increase in new listings, um, which would be a sign that, hey, maybe we're going to see some adjustment in price. So I moved this up to the front. Weekly inventory change went from 494.862 to 494.29. So what, about 800 homes um, in the market went Essentially down. no change whatsoever. Yeah, very, very little change when you're talking those types of numbers. Um, and then we'll see new listings. So new listings, what, roughly 50,000 new listings um, over the, the, the previous uh, week last year. Um, but it's, you know, we're, st we're, st well, no, 106, I'm sorry, hundred what was that say? 16% more than last year, 49,559. Yeah, sorry. So inventory is a new listing still coming on the market, but you can see, we kind of ticked down from that big increase that we saw the previous week, uh, which again is kind of to be expected at the moment. There's, there's still some buyer demand out there in the market. It's another sign at new listings. Um, you see roughly 50,000. Homes coming on the market versus 42,000 last year, back in 2022. We pretty much the same as where we are now, somewhere around 49,000 homes. So starting to look a little bit like 2022 in regards to those new listing numbers, but there was a big difference in that time because the market was bananas in the first, first quarter of that year. Now, weekly new pendings, um, we saw uh, an increase year over year in the number of contracts going um, into escrow, which again... It's that time of the year, which, you know, coming off higher interest rates, we've seen some lower rates. So some of what you're seeing, people have been able to capture lower rates um, prior to the adjustment that we've seen, um, which is why you're seeing pending contracts come up. This data is about a week old when when you see it here. So, um, you know, if if and when we see rates go up higher, you might see pending home sales fall a little bit. Uh, median home price ticking up a little bit, sitting at 425000 The median price of new listings coming in in just under 400000 which is essentially where we've been over the last couple of weeks. Percent of properties with price reductions. This number is continuing to go down, kind of move sideways at the moment, but we're in the bottom end of what's normal, which is around 30% of homes on the market. So we're still seeing um, you know, 30%, one third of homes essentially are, are getting some sort of price reduction, but we're at the lower end of what is actually normal going back historically speaking. So nothing really alarming there, nothing to, to really to worry about. So Josh, this chart, we're looking at core CPI. Um, and, and based on the, the, what I'm seeing there, the rent, um, owner's equivalent rent trending up a little bit, which is one of the reasons that we saw that CPI number jump. 
yeah, that's the biggest contribution. And I also um, saw an interview with an analyst who was saying, hey, I really prefer the truthlation number. So 0.97% correlation. So 97% correlation to CPI, but much more real time. And we're going to see that number here in a second. And it's been trending down massively. You're like, why? What's the disparity? And the not owner, the, the big wig over at Truflation said, it's that we are able to pick up changes in housing and shelter way, way, way faster. So this chart shows that. The other thing I thought that was interesting about this, Jeb, is just looking at that red line. It doesn't go in a straight line. So people thinking June or June, June, we're not there yet. January popped up. So now that's a new trend and we're going to be going back up. Inflation is going to be increasing. But if you see in this downtrend, you have the trend line going down, but we've had in the middle of 2022, it had gone down and went back up, started going back down twice last year. We had these little month over month spikes up and that's on a six month average. That red line is a six month annualized average. So important to know um, big adjustments in the, the payroll data in January and some adjustments to the CPI stuff. So we'll get a better handle here in the first quarter. And a lot of that Jeb is leaking back into um, the charts that you were showing there that we're not seeing as many homes coming on the market as people had hoped or expected because if rates were six and a quarter instead of seven percent you would have more people selling even though we're very early in that selling season so well i think it's important to note josh too if you started to see rents increase now those aren't even hitting the the numbers that we're really seeing for almost another year right because it's a it's a lagging indicator so you can't look at what's happening right this second in the market right now and say this is what's happening in the data because the data doesn't reflect what's happening right now. It's reflecting what happened 12 months ago, essentially. So just keep that in mind. So, and think of this in terms of there's, there's multiple components in there. There's actual rents for people that have to rent and there's owner equivalent rents and owner equivalent rents tracks pretty closely. It sounds like a weird way of tracking. It is a weird um, way of tracking. It, right. it is, but it, it tracks pretty darn closely to, to home value. So as the home values go up and home values have been going up, but at a very, very minimal rate relative to the last few years, as, as that lagging data catches up, it's going to come down. When you look at apartment rents, we have the biggest amount of apartments coming online in one year in history this year that is going to put downward pressure on rents. So that will continue to moderate um, and we'll watch it and we'll go through and we'll dissect the numbers month after month this year. That's the truflation number that we're showing you. Downtrend definitely still intact right there at the end of January. It took a big jump down. Um, so they're at 1.61, well below the 2%. Um, so that's not to say that Fed should be setting policy off of this, but I'll tell you, if I'm making policy for me and my household, this is much better data than either either PCE or what CPI kind of policies that, do you set in your household, Josh? Let's well, talk about whether, it. whether my dog is going to be able to get a big or a small bark box, whether she's going to be able to get, you know, extra beds. It's really, it's the only decisions that we make policy wise around our house. It's what, what my dog fair, is allowed fair to enough. have. So this year, again, just showing the, the Fed watch, nothing really changed from, from last week, looking at high probability of no change until June. Um, but we're going to have a lot of data between now and then. What are we going to get? Uh, next week, we have PCE. So we got February, March, April, May. Before June, we will have four reads on PCE before then, um, with a lot of things showing the, the economy slowing. So that'll be an interesting one. We've shown so many of these charts here, Jeb, of showing mortgage activity, home sales activity, how low it is. You know, we went from over 6 million sales to 4 million sales here. So looking at that, um, the other thing or the other piece of the economy that comes in as a part of that furniture and home furnishings, people buy a lot of that stuff when they buy a house, homes aren't selling. So that stuff is trending down as well. Um, 30 year mortgage rates remain high. So CPI for household furnishings and operations, household furnishings, and supplies, household insurance, those also have been trending down because there's less demand for those items as less homes are selling. This one, uh, you're probably going to need to uh, download the slides from the link to, to get this. But this uh, every month, the Mortgage Bankers Association, their economists update their forecasts for the year. This just came out this week. So um, if you look to the far side, it, it's probably a little better looking at their annual uh, expectations. So for GDP, they're expecting 0.8% GDP growth here in, in 2024. That's two months into the year. They're not backing off that number. They're expecting low growth. So we may not get a recession, but we're likely to get very low growth. Um, PCE, they're expecting at 1.3% for the year. Unemployment rate, they expect it to be up to 4.1%, which that could happen in a matter of months. It's not that out there. Um, 
Fed funds, they expect it to be 5375 for the course of the year. So they're not expecting m much in terms of change. And, and the 10 year treasury at 44. We closed today about 432, 433, somewhere in that range. So they're not expecting a whole lot of change in terms of, of interest rates from that perspective. How does that translate into their mortgage expectations and real estate expectations here? Um, home sales, uh, last year we ended at just about 4.1 million homes. They're expecting that to go up to 4.3. That's that's pretty right, pretty much right in line, Jeb, with what we we had in our forecast. Somewhere in that 425, 43 range, jumping to 48 next year and 499 the following year. So in terms of that home price appreciation, they're expecting 4.1% this year, 3.3% next year, 3.9. So just really continued muted gains. So no crash, no big spike, um, muted gains there. In terms of interest rates, 6.1%, they expect to be the average for 2024, 5.5% next year and a hair below that in 2026. So nowhere near the juiced up rates you know, at 3%, 35 4% that would lead to increased volume. And for mortgage originations, they expect this year will be almost 20% better than last year. Next year, maybe 10, 15% better and, and pretty similar for 2026. So anyone expecting a return to these massive boom times where there's tons of home sales, tons of mortgage origination, super low interest rates, home prices going up, unlikely to, to happen. I threw this one in here, Jeb, just I thought it was interesting. I don't know that it really says much at all about housing or real estate, but we actually had the largest one-year population increase in U.S. history last year. And you may be saying, that's weird. I heard that we have the lowest birth rate in the history of the country. We do. So that is what a porous border will do for you. We had 3.8 million uh, new Americans or American residents, occupants of America last year. So that will impact some things long-term. Uh, we're, we're hearing that post-election that both sides are agreeing they're gonna take this seriously and work on it. Um, this was a little bit hard to see, but that blue line, this is the 10-year treasury. That blue line is a pivot. We are right at a pivot. So if you look over the last one, two, three, four, five, six days, we've hit that four, three, two, four, three, three. That is a, an important pivot for us. If we break it's, through that rate, rates are likely to get a little bit worse. It's going higher. That's not a good chart. Jeb, Jeb's a pessimist. So um, take I, it, take I, it for I what it's am worth. a technical an analyst and I'm telling you that's going higher. We'll be back next week and we will, well, we won't have PCE data. The only, so in terms of this, what's likely to move the market, you're sitting there moving sideways, 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 because we haven't had a lot of data. What data have we had that is not positive for interest rates? So um, when you look at the trend coming off the bottom there, uh, generally you need something big to come along uh, fundamentals wise to change that trend. So from that perspective, Mortgage News Daily is reporting 7.14%. Optimal Blue is still reporting 69 uh, on 30-year fixed rates and looking at FHA 6.63 and 6.681. So from that perspective, not uh, a whole lot of movement over the last week. Jeb? Well, guys, all just great news, isn't it? Isn't that great news? Uh, no, more importantly, uh, you know, it, it, the data is what the data is, right? We're here to just give it to you, um, give our best interpretation of the data and continue to follow it and update you guys as, you know, things happen. So um, ideally, you know, that 433 area holds and we do see rates trend lower, kind of an upward channel. So if it breaks to the low side and breaks that channel, it probably moves lower, but it's at the high side of that channel right now. And, um, you know, just, just if you just took that chart alone without any other lines on it, it, uh, it doesn't look great. So I hope that when we come back next week, I was absolutely wrong, uh, but we will see. So this is the time of the show, guys, where we ask you guys to ask us questions, right? That's the whole point of us being here. It's not to talk about the economy. It's not to talk about interest rates or what we did this week. It's really to provide education so that you guys can make better decisions in the process and or just find out information that you just don't know about, right? I mean, that is the goal of the show. And if you're not aware, there's a podcast, there's another YouTube channel outside of this channel called the Educated Home Buyer Podcast that is strictly that. Uh, it's a deep dive into topics to walk you through the process. So if you're listening on the Educated Home Buyer, check out Jeb Smith uh, because I talk about different things on that channel in addition to real estate, but the educated homebuyer is primarily around real estate and mortgage to 
you know, to help you make better decisions. So either way, wherever you're watching, do us a favor, hit the subscribe button, like the content. Uh, it does help it grow. And if you've listened to any of the podcasts and you haven't done so already, rating and reviewing is huge when it comes to podcasts. Huge. So that will help us. And we'll be very grateful for that. So Josh, I'm looking here. I don't really see a lot of questions. Did you, uh, have you started anything here? No stars? No you stars, know, but we do have some people nothing. reaching out. Um, I, I know we already put Kel on here, but I'm going to do it again. Saying congrats on the 100. Appreciate it. Omar, uh, you know, is that a high five or is that a praying sign? I've been told it's it's both. I, I've always thought it was You don't praying, know which side of the debate. But you somebody said, no, dude, it's a, it's a two high fives going together. And I'm like, maybe it is. Maybe I've been wrong. Um, we got here's Nelly. my take, Jeb. If it were high fives, they wouldn't have the same shirt on. Why would were they teammates or they're wearing a long sleeve? Maybe I'm high five myself, dude, because I am so happy that <laughs> okay. I just did. I got a hundred thousand subs. Uh, but Melly saying hello, uh, just looking, saying congrats, appreciate it. Uh, enough time travel saying, uh, it was just a matter of time. Well done, congrats. So awesome, appreciate it. Uh, we do have a question here. Imagine that. Uh, we are going to click on it. Uh, it is Burns, Fines, and more. Says both from Victorville. Uh, congrats again on the 100K. Did your kids claim the plaque already? No, I, I didn't even. I can't read the question, but no, it, it takes a little while for it to come in. Um, so a couple months, I, I think we'll have it. We'll we'll uh, we'll we'll bring it on the show, and you guys can um, can uh, see it and all that good stuff. If if you care. Do we actually have any questions? <laughs> Real estate really? You got an answer to your question. Enough oh, time yeah. travel says it's. Namaste is what ah, that says. Um, oh, there, there you go. Namaste. Um, I only know what that means because I've been to like a yoga class before and I only interpreted what it meant. I truly don't know what it means. Um, just I think it's like relax. Hey, Jeb, relax. Namaste. Um, Holly Brown, we've had our house for four months on the market for four months. No offer. Should we just make it a rental or wait and give it a few more months? So Holly, this is one of those questions that's difficult to answer without knowing your situation. But what I will say is that if you have the means to keep the property as a rental, it's not going to affect your down payment ability. It's not going to affect your ability to um, qualify for the home. You're comfortable with the monthly payment without selling that home. Why? I mean, and you're not going to be in some big, you know, upside down position by renting it out versus what your mortgage is, keep it, right? I mean, I don't think anyone ever went broke holding property long term. Um, it is it is definitely something that if you can do it, I mean, the people that I know that have been able to hold on real estate every time they've 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 jumped in and purchased another property are all very well financially. Um, they've all done very well financially. Uh, and I think time is the is the big piece that you need to pay attention to there when talking about it. So if you can do it, great. Um, if not, then, but just know that there are a couple components there when you do decide to rent something out, that if it, if you, if you no longer have lived in that property two of the last five years, right, which again, there's, there's three years that can happen before that actually takes place. Um, you lose, uh, that, that capital gains exemption that you have, if you, if you've made more than a, a certain amount of money in the property. Uh, and then the other thing is, you know, once it's a rental, you know, it's a rental for a period of time, you know, if whether it's six months or 12 months or whatever the number is. So if you decide at that point to sell it, you have to sell it as a rental with somebody in it, which is more difficult to do, or you have to wait. So you have to, you know, take that all into consideration. Anything to add to that, Josh? No, not not really. I just think it's interesting that four minutes ago we had no questions, and they just we got on fire over here. We don't know we're going to get to all these questions in the hour. So, we're definitely going to get to all these questions. Off. We're going to get to these questions. Um, I just see one here that's really easy. It's one of the latter ones that came in, but we're going to get to it real quick. Uh, have income limits adjusted for inflation on USDA, Josh? Uh, you, you say it's a very easy question. USDA, just because um, probably 70% of my business is California and very few areas of California, even out in the rural areas, you get up North California, Northern California, there are, um, we just don't have a lot in the USDA market. So I can, I can Google it while you're answering a question. I'll, I'll hit the Goog here and, and try and get an answer on that. My expectation would be yes, uh, but I couldn't tell you for sure. All right, we'll get, we'll get one that I can answer in a minute, but there's a couple here that are pretty easy for you to answer, so we're going to throw them up there. Uh, ZL's asking, what's the credit score needed for the best VA loan? 
What's most the lenders? Um, it's six eighty. Um, some of them, it's only six forty. But there are lenders that, for whatever reason, they're trying to generate more high credit score business. So they might be giving an, an incentive. So. 720, I've really never seen anyone doing any higher than 720, 740. But oftentimes I go through and my lenders that 640 is their top tier has the best pricing. So it really, if you get above 640, you're going to get a good rate. 680, you're going to get close enough to the best rate that it wouldn't be worth the time, effort, and energy to chase a higher credit score. Other than, you know, we did that episode last week on the Educated Home Buyer, all of the benefits that come along with having a higher credit score. All right. There's a couple questions here around refinancing that Josh, you can go hit the Google now if you want that I'll, I'll kind of jump on. Um, one comes from Barry May says, when doing a refinance, how can you use equity to lower your monthly payment if it's possible? So the easiest way I would say is that essentially you could buy down the rate um, with with that uh, some of the money, the equity in your property which would essentially just get added to your loan balance. The other thing you could do instead of maybe lowering the rate on your your monthly payment is maybe pull some cash out and pay off if you have credit cards. If you have if sometimes it makes sense to pay off car loans, other times it doesn't. You know, you've got to kind of d decide on how long you have on those remaining, what the rates are and do some analysis there, but maybe it's not your mortgage payment that you're lowering, maybe it's paying off some other things with that money that allows your overall expenses to come down. That's kind of the way that I would think about it. Now, Josh, I don't know if you're paying attention or or not, but yeah, you the, to add the, to that. the big thing. So Barry is here every week. Um, we helped him last year buy his property here in, in California. Um, the, the big thing is you don't want to use your equity. Um, the, a lot of the big call centers that carpet bomb people with mailers. And actually, Barry texted me this morning. Barry got a very deceptive uh, mailer uh, saying, you've you're, you just met your waiting period on your FHA loan because we closed that at 210 days. You're eligible to do a streamline. And they'll tell you, hey, we can pay two points and you can get this rate. So you're using equity to lower the interest rate. But it's smoke and mirrors because you're giving that up, and the the recoup period uh, is you know six seven years on that. So I would say very be very very careful of anyone suggesting you pay a significant amount of points to get an interest rate on a refinance. But like you said, Jeb, if we're looking at lowering your monthly payments, if you have other debts and we have some equity, um, a lot. I wouldn't say a lot, but we've seen the numbers in terms of credit card debt, student loan debt. Uh, you can pay off student loan debt with home equity and it's not considered cash out under Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac guidelines. So some of those things, you could definitely make a case for it being a worthwhile use of funds. But for the most part, uh, yeah, I just wouldn't do it. All right. Good stuff. Uh, Rimstar has another question around refinancing, says if you build equity in your home, if you refinance, can that equity count towards removing PMI? Absolutely. Uh, so there's two things that can allow you to remove PMI. One is building uh, appreciation, building equity in that home. The other is paying down the principal balance of that loan. And either regardless of what you do, uh, either or or both um, can help you in removing that PMI. So uh, if that's a question that you have, you know, talk to a mortgage professional, kind of let them see, you know, what your loan balance is, what the home is worth and kind of give you an idea. In some cases, you might be able to call the lender directly, depending on how long you've had that loan to see if they can remove it without refinancing. Um, but you have options there, but make sure you're working with somebody reputable because otherwise, you know, every person is going to try to get you to refinance when in some cases you might not need to. So just something to keep in mind. Uh, Josh, um, we had a couple here. Uh, let's, let's ask you, well, it doesn't matter who, who does it, but I'm still not understanding the inflation rate. Can you re explain the inflation rate? So Josh, what is the rate of inflation? What does that actually mean? The rate is the percentage change of a basket of goods on a year over year basis. We actually, we get a month over month change. Uh, and then the 12 monthly readings are added together to give you a year over year change. So when we say that the Fed is looking for inflation to be at or below its 2% target, they prefer PCE over CPI. Um, we talked earlier in the show about trueflation. All of these are simply measures of a basket of goods that represent what you as an American pay on a daily basis for living, you know, utilities, uh, insurance, 
medical bills, uh, tuitions, even Food. if you don't have students yeah. or children, food, automobiles, housing, mm -hmm. literally everything. It is a monstrously huge undertaking, both CPI and PCE. The Fed prefers PCE. Um, there's a substitution effect in there. CPI, they keep the goods the same. Um, whereas PCE, they look at it and they say, hey, if steak went up to $50 a pound, people would buy more chicken and they're still going to get their protein and on and on throughout the economy. Um, PCE tends to be a little bit lower, a little bit more stable, and they both use the core reading. And core just means excluding food and energy. It's a big misconception. We get people commenting all the time, that's bullshit that the Fed excludes food and energy. I can't not eat and I can't not drive my car. That's not why they exclude them. They're not trying to lower the number. They have very little control over the prices of food and energy. So when they're looking at the, the core rate, they're saying, what is the rate of inflation on the things that we can control with our policy measures? So hopefully uh, that is, is helpful. That chart that we showed earlier in the show, we're showing six month uh, rates on an annualized basis. And the Fed looks at the 12 month rate and they do look at the month over month, but they're really wanting to see that 12 month annualized rate. All right. Good stuff. Good, good breakdown there. Um, Alma's got a question asking, I got approved to get my PMI removed. What percent would I get back? It's been two years and we've paid PMI all up front. You get nothing back. There's no there's no return in PMI. Um, there are, Jeb, refundable mortgage insurance policies. Oh, they're just incredibly rarely used because they're more expensive. You pay more up front, but in certain rare instances, you well, can't get go. it refunded. I was wrong. You're not wrong because you've never heard it because it just like never happens. It's very, very rarely used. So um, from, from that perspective, it's not a matter of them refunding you. But if you did, you can do a lump sum. Most people don't know or are unaware that in addition to doing the monthly premium, you can do an upfront premium or you can do a split premium where you pay a little bit upfront and it lowers the monthly. So she did an upfront premium. And if they did a refundable upfront premium, it would be worth checking. But the only way to find out would be to call the, the lender or look back in your loan documents that would give you the details of that from when you signed the original loan docs. There you go. That's why we have a mortgage pro on the show. And 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 your real estate agent's not answering uh, all the mortgage questions. All right. So we got another question here that I want to click on. Uh, Sandy says, I'm looking for a house in Ventura. But the inventory is very low. Uh, there isn't much that I've liked in the last month. Should I wait on getting pre-approved until peak season, April to summer? Uh, no. Jeb, Jeb it, it's almost like we've had this discussion previously. <laughs> yeah. it's, in fact, we had this discussion today on a podcast, uh, which will be out next week. If you guys are interested, we're talking about the, the cyclical, the seasonality of real estate. So it's a good episode. And you know, it's, it's something you guys should listen to. But to answer this question, I almost want to take it back a year, year and a half ago, when we had another listener here on the show uh, that was looking for a property in the same market, having similar issues, I actually referred them to an agent that I know in that market that was able to get them a property. Um, she's a bulldog. She's a hell of a negotiator and uh, was able to not only get the property secured, but get it at a at a discount uh, per the, the listing price on that property. So you know, the sooner you can get pre-approved, the sooner you know that you're good to go. There's nothing you need to work on. You have an idea of what the payments are going to be. You have an idea, again, of a solid price that you're comfortable with based on those numbers. And it gives you uh, validity in in knowing that you can go out there and, and make offers and have a reasonable idea of what that's going to be. So I would say sooner than later, um, because again, if there's something you need to work on that you don't know about, it gives you time to, to work on that. Uh, and in the meantime, if you need a real estate agent in that market, uh, can happily refer you to somebody that I know, like, and trust up there that, that knows that market well, can guide you through that process. So just reuse that referral link below. And that can also get you connected to a pro on the mortgage side and, or the real estate side, really anywhere in the nation. So if you're looking for experts, that is the link and the best way to get a hold of somebody. Um, Josh, this is a question I'm going to throw your way. I don't really have the answer for it. Um, but it is asking what are the best and worst builders in SoCal based on our experience? Are, well, are you aware of any that are awful? No. And, and you know what? Whenever this question comes up, we'll have some people comment that, hey, I bought from this builder and they suck. Yep. So for California, because it's a big market and the land is expensive, it's primarily all the big national builders. Yeah. When you get to local markets where you have 
smaller local builders is where you're more likely to come across a builder. My, I have a bunch of family in North Idaho, Jeb, as you know, and there's builders in town that people are like, do, do not buy a house from them. They suck. And then there's other builders. They're amazing. If you can afford it, um, they're, they're wonderful. So on the national side, I don't think you, you can be a, a big giant national lender and be cheating people and doing crappy work on the houses, or at least that awful. Yeah, and California is so strict on on policies and and everything else, you know, with with you know, the cities and and having um you know inspectors come out is it's it's the dil- due diligence is is usually there. But what I will say is we you know I know Texas during the craziness of of twenty one twenty two. They had some big name builders. I, I don't want to throw out any names because I'm not even confident in the names that I remember reading. Uh, but they were having issues with some of these homes. And it, at that time, these these guys were throwing up homes so quickly just to keep up with demand that I think you know some of the construction was uh, was not done uh, as well as it could have been. I think we're less in that right now. Um, and then, like I said, everything that's here in SoCal for the most part is is bigger builders. Um, and, and, and something to know about California, I don't know if this is nationwide or just California, Josh, but there's a 10 year warranty on new construction, um, a 10 year home warranty that they are responsible for coming back and, and fixing any, any problems. So when you're dealing with a reputable builder, you've got a little bit of backup there, uh, at least on that side. Uh, Josh, we have someone that is frustrated and, um, using the word desperate, and talking about pulling money from a 401k. Is that a desperate move or could it potentially be a good move? I think it could be a smart move. But when we talk about willing to pull from my 401k, how do we pull from it? If you just take a distribution, if you're not of retirement age, you're going to have two issues with that. You're going to have a penalty and 10% early withdrawal penalty. Then you're going to pay taxes on that income. So um, you, you didn't pay taxes on the way in, so you're really just paying what you should have paid all along, but the 10% penalty, is gonna hurt. So don't love that unless we've got no other option and you really, really, really want to. But you can take a loan against that to, to help the numbers. And in, in that instance, you're not depleting your 401k, the money's still in there. You're making a loan to yourself and you're gonna pay it back with interest. So from that perspective, I like the idea of a loan. Uh, it can be a very good tool and, and help people like from, from this perspective. If you have $25,000 saved and it's gonna cost you $22,000 to get into a house, but you've got $100,000 saved in your 401k and we can do a $25,000 loan, I would rather see someone stay liquid with their money in the bank. There's going to be things when you buy a house. There's going to be issues. You're going to need a new couch. The water heater is going to go out, whatever it may be. Um, I would rather see someone have a cushion uh, and versus using up every last nickel that they have. Cotton Candy has a follow up here, Jeb. She says, yeah, the new no, home I see builder, the rate. I was about to click on that. Yep. The new home builder in my area is offering 4.99 fixed rate. How can they offer a lower interest rate? This is too good to be true. We've talked about this on the show probably 50 times. Builders have a margin at any given time of plus or minus 25%. So they like during the pandemic were north of 30%. They were making record levels of profit. Uh, last year, it was 25-ish or so, and it can go as low as 20. But let's look at that. You're buying a $500,000 house in a normal time, they've got a 25% margin on that. So we got $125,000 of profit. If they need to pay three or four points to buy your rate down to 4.99, you know, it's most likely an FHA interest rate. It's easier, uh, less of a buy down to, to get there. So from that perspective, four points is $20,000. So they're still hitting their 20% plus margin. That's how much margin they have in it. And that's how much they stand to lose okay. if they keep that property on the books, or if they have to discount the property, then they have everyone that just bought from them mad that price has dropped and they have a precedent set for the next sale. So they are very good at managing the process of managing their margins. Because think about this, they technically own the property free and clear, but they don't. There's financing for the entire project. And as each property sells, they can pay back the financing and generate uh, money and, and stop having the carrying costs on that. So it costs them money to keep the property. They're not in the business of owning homes and they want to keep the price up. So if they can do that by giving you incentives, that's why they can do it where a traditional seller doesn't have any chance of getting a rate that low. All right. Good stuff. Uh, kind of on the, not on the same topic, but 
about rates, I guess, is 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 the correlation here. Uh, can a broker get you better rates than what's showing on Mortgage News Daily? Also, our offer our lenders offering credits to entice buyers. So, Josh, I'll, I'll kind of just throw that your way. Lenders don't offer credits um, in that sense, in the sense that you are asking. So we'll start with the first part. There is no one channel. There was a big movement five or six years ago. All the brokers jump out. Brokers are better. Always get your loan from a broker. You can get a great loan and better terms in Mortgage News Daily from any channel, from uh, a non-bank lender like not this one specifically, but the biggest one that everyone is aware of is Rocket. They're never going to give you good terms, no matter what their commercial says. Um, a credit union, a bank, all of those are good options. Jeb got an offer he couldn't refuse from U.S. Bank. Am I allowed to say that, Jeb? When yeah, when sure. you yeah, when when you, when you when you bought your house, yeah. like I could have I could have matched it, but we wouldn't have made any money, and it would have been to a lender that I didn't feel comfortable with that was going to be able to give him the service, and we knew that he would get that from from where he went. So, uh, in that case, I would never think, "Hey, Jeb, go to a big bank; you're going to get the best deal." But in his specific deal, that was the case. If you're in certain parts of the country, a local credit union might have the best deal. So that's why we always say, talk to more than one lender. So you know that you're getting fair terms. If they're both pretty similar, maybe you don't need to call another lender. Maybe you feel like, hey, let me call one more and see if they're any lower or higher. But from that perspective, what I have as a broker, I have on almost any loan product, 30 to 40 different lenders that I can send that loan to. And on any given day, from my best price lender to a middle of the pack lender is a point and a half difference. So not that's not a percent and a half in interest rate, but on a $500,000 loan, it's a $7,500 difference in the price for the same interest rate. So leading to your second question, are lenders offering credits to entice buyers? They don't do it that way. They give you a rate sheet that goes on any given day from probably a high of almost 8% right now to a low of about 5%. And there's a cost for every one of those interest rates. The par rate, the rate that is zero points, is kind of where they want to generate loans. The further you get away from that, the more points you have to pay to, to get it. So probably we're seeing margin compression. We're seeing lenders saying, hey, we, we have capacity and we don't have the loans to keep uh, our, our employees working. So they have probably uh, shrunk their margins uh, in terms of what that rate sheet displays. Um, but yeah, and, and go back to saying, a, a good lender should be able to beat Mortgage News Daily. If I if all I could do was match Mortgage News Daily on a daily basis, even though those numbers are good, I I, I would probably be looking for a better place to source my loans or to to hang my license to work under. Um, so hopefully hopefully that helps. But above above and beyond, it is important to get a competitive rate and, and good fees. It's more important to work with an expert that can manage the process. Very few people have such a squeaky clean file that they can go anywhere. And the dumbest, greenest kid in the call center who might be offering the lowest interest rates can manage that process in a way that you need it to and deal with, with problems and issues that can and will come up. All right, that was Josh's pitch for this evening. So he's done. We're not allowing, we're taking his soapbox away. Uh, no, uh, if you need that referral, there's a link scroll in the bottom right now that'll get you to somebody that can guide you through that process. Also in the description as well. Um, you know, if you're finding any value tonight, do us a favor, hit the thumbs up. Um, again, it helps the YouTube algorithm. There's 155 of you watching and not nearly as many people have taken the time to do that. And we're here giving you our time and asking for very little. And with that, we'd be very thankful. So Josh, there's a couple of questions here. Let's we, we're getting more and more questions. So we're going to have to move if we want to get through this stuff. So <laughs> um, answers. Al, Alberto says, I want to get rid of my PMI, but I'm not sure my house is already appreciated enough. Should I hire a professional to get a better idea of how much my house is worth? What I would do, Alberto, start with your real estate agent. Who sold you the house? Who represented you as the, your agent when you bought the house? Reach out to them and say, hey, what do you think my my house is worth? That'll give you a really good idea. Say, be conservative, um, you know, on the number, and then take your loan amount, whatever you owe on that property, divide it into that loan amount. It's going to give you your loan to value. It needs to be at 0.8 or 80 um, percent in order to get that PMI removed. Now, some lenders, depending on how long you've had your loan, may give you a little bit of grief on on being able to just remove it without refinancing. If that's the case. You know, show back up here. We'll tell you how to do it. You can also talk to a lender who can refinance you in some cases and get you uh, and get rid of that PMI. But depending on what your rate is, you might not want to do that, right? But if you have a super low rate, you probably want to avoid that refi refinance and just avoid the PMI altogether. So 
talk to a pro um, and see if you got the equity there. That's where I'd start. Um, Jeb, Josh, Jeb, when, yep. when we get our when we get our stream decks, some of these I'm going to have like six buttons with guidelines there that we can pull up. Just or pop at least up. post post to the comments just so people can look at it because that comes up every week and and it's a fairly straightforward guideline um, that we could just give you the link to and, and it, it gives you more detail on what we can do in the context of the show. There you go. Uh, this one is something that uh, I'll be honest, I've, I've crapped on it for the better part of, you know, five, six years, and I'm starting to have uh, different thoughts on it. But it says, do you guys think solar and soft water are a good investment for a property if you don't plan on selling anytime soon here in SoCal? Congrats on the 100K. So appreciate the uh, the the acknowledgement there. I appreciate it. Uh, the support as well. Um, so soft water is great. Uh, if you don't have soft water, I mean, if you're by the beach here in Huntington beach, the water's super hard. So soft water is great. Is it going to get you any more money on the property? Probably not. Um, now you'll have buyers that, that absolutely want soft water tanks and all of that that goes with it. But I don't think you can change the, you know, the price that you're selling your home for because you have soft water versus not, um, just, just my thoughts. Solar on the other hand is one of the things that I was talking about a moment ago. Solar, if you have paid solar and it's, you know, not a lease, um, leases to me are garbage. I, I, I you can't do a lease. They're a pain in the ass when it goes to sell the property. Somebody has to take over it. It's just, I would avoid the lease. If you can buy it outright and pay for it, I think solar could make sense. Um, but what I would say is, you know, you need to, in my opinion, you need to have things like electric cars that you're charging all the time pools, uh, that you're running, you know, um, uh, you know, equipment on, um, you need to have air conditioning that you're running nonstop, that sort of thing. Like you need to be using a lot of electricity for this to make sense in many ways. Just my thought. Um, you know, if your bill is constantly four or five, 600 bucks a month, it probably makes sense to get solar. If your bill is 200 bucks a month, 250 a month, probably doesn't make sense to get solar because the recoup is so long. Um, Josh, anything you want to add on that one? Go to Google Project Sunroof. Um, it's sunroof.withgoogle.com. Um, you can put in your address. It will give you the little, they look at your property that it takes into account trees, shade, direction you face. Uh, and then probably the best thing you need to do is go back and look at your last 12 months uh, utility bills and know what they are. Because when you plug that in, it tells you in your area, what's the break even. So the house could get the same amount of sun. But like for me in Huntington Beach, it's not nearly as valuable as someone in Victorville, where it's, you know, on average in the summer, 25, 30 degrees hotter. Uh, so look at all of those things. I can tell you from my perspective, uh, the last five, 10 years, I would look at it occasionally in Project Sunroof and I'll go, that's stupid. Doesn't make sense. It's getting really close now. But what I can say is the technology keeps getting better and cheaper. Mm -hmm. So when you look at it from that perspective, uh, probably in the next five years, it'll be something where Jeb and I will look at it and go, well, it, it makes sense for us. It may make sense for you right now. If you're in Texas, you're in Arizona, you're in the desert here in California, it might make sense today. Yeah. Yeah. And there's some incentives sometimes to do it. So you know, the, all of those things factor in, but don't, don't get sold. These companies can charge whatever they want and you'll find two different companies do the same thing and big margin. So when you do it, if you decide to do it, shop it, price accordingly, find out what you get, all of that good stuff. Um, don't get sold on the warranties and all that crap because that stuff can disappear in a heartbeat. Uh I digress. We're moving on. Uh, Burns got a quick question here. Just a follow-up. Has my rate prediction for the end of the year changed just based on the fluctuation rates now? No, no. We're still early in the year. Um, I still think inflation is going down. I still think everything that we said in the forecast is going to happen. It's just, you know, there's so much volatility in the market. We've been talking about volatility for the last couple of years, and unfortunately, we're still dealing with it. So um, I think the rates are still on trend to do what we said they were going to do. Well, now that you told us what's happening with rates, uh, Scott would like to know, are housing prices going up this summer since inventory is still historically low? Will low inventory drive prices up? Where is that question, Josh? I don't see. Did you put it on the screen? Yeah. Oh, I didn't see it flagged. Um, you know, probably. Uh, you know, here's the here's the 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 one thing, right? If, if interest rates continue to climb from here, if you see interest rates go above 7% and stay above 7% for an extended period of time, you could get flat flat to, you know, maybe even a slightly down in house prices. I don't think that's going to happen. I don't think rates are going to stay there for any extended period of time. So I don't see that being the case. 
Uh, but rates are the one factor at the moment that could keep appreciation um, limited this year. And, and in turn, it, it'll it'll limit the number of transactions taking place. It'll it's gonna it could eliminate uh, limit not eliminate limit a lot. On the flip side, if you see some more inventory come to the market um, and rates stay where they are right now, or and or trend lower, I think you're going to see appreciation. I, th- I think yeah, you're you know. Three, four, five percent is is reasonable, um, at least here in Southern California, nationwide. You know, I flat to to slightly above that is is reasonable as well. I mean, very reasonable in my opinion. So, just my thoughts. Jeb, there's been a ghost sighting. Ghost sighting. Oh boy, I can't. Uh, which comments are you on here? Here, uh, I the can't very read. Very last Ooh, one. There we go. She Jennifer she had, Lego says yeah. in two weeks it will be a one year home anniversary. Congratulations, Jennifer. So for those of you who don't know, Jennifer was uh, a a moderator on the channel and uh, helped us out for a, she was a viewer, just somebody that showed up every single week, a lot like a lot of you guys, but continued to show up um, every single week and was the first one here and uh, constantly helped out. So she became a moderator for the channel, helped us kind of keep you you guys in check. um, And she bought a house. Almost a year ago. So congrats on that, Jennifer. She reached out and congratulated me on the 100000 too. So very, very thankful. She's been working evenings. That's that's the reason she says she's not here. It's probably a man. That's okay. We're okay with that. Just, you know, you do you. Do you. Um, but we, we appreciate it. Appreciate you reaching out. Uh, let's see. This, this is going to trigger a couple of people that will take it the wrong way, but I like hearing stories like this. Bryce is really just telling a story. No question here, Jeb. Just bought a really cool move-in ready 1890s commercial storefront with two apartments above in Grand Rapids, Michigan back in 2017 for 40K cash. It's a former opera house building. Uh, lots of Californians have moved here since COVID shut down. Recently had my property appraised and the realtor estimated it's worth about 700000 now. That is is really awesome. And for for those of you listening, go that's unrealistic. That sucks. That's crap. Um, I will still say, lots of areas in the Midwest, you can go get really nice properties at really reasonable prices if you're able to to relocate. No, good for you. I mean, again, that's what you know. Real estate is all about. You saw an opportunity. Maybe you didn't see it for that opportunity, but you saw it as a place that would benefit you. And in in it was the right time in your life for whatever reason, and you've been able to to uh, to reap the rewards of that. So congratulations. Uh, Coella, 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 Kayla, 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 fucking Kayla. Wow. Sorry, guys. Um, I'm, t- you know, I it's, it's you been guys a long week, understand. Jeb. Well, here's the deal. I, I, I feel like I need to explain myself, not because of the name spelling, just because I keep squinting at the screen. So I, I, I used to have my screen over here, which I still have that would have everything on it. And so I would be just staring into a camera lens, never looking at Josh, never looking at the questions, just staring into a lens and having this conversation. Well, over the last couple of weeks, we brought, we bought teleprompters where I can actually put Josh's face and the questions in front of me so I can actually look at Josh and look at the questions as I'm talking. The problem is the, my eyesight's really great the, the uh, problem is it's a nine inch monitor on the prompter it's a nine inch monitor and the and you know some of the you know letters look the same so it looked like k-o-e-l-a from here and if i squint a lot i can see it's an a now um but nevertheless the 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 font size is tiny uh and therefore it's uh causing my vision to um to be impaired a little bit but nevertheless Kayla has a question, says, I'm 28, single mom, one child, got approved for a $300,000 home, homes, houses are being taken fast, three bedroom, two baths, should I go for it as a first time home buyer? So Josh, you have somebody asking you that type of question, what is your response? So let's go back to the answer we always give. Buy when it's the right time in your life. So you have some financial stability. You're comfortable in your job. You're earning. You've been able to save. You have good credit. You have relationship stability if a relationship is important to you. You're not dating someone long distance and might move to Florida tomorrow unless you're already in Florida. So assuming that all of those ducks are in a row, what I would say is you got approved for a $300,000 home. Have we gone through and do we know what principal, interest, taxes, insurance, any HOA? All of that, are we comfortable with it? How much reserves are we going to have? 
So if all of that is in, in a row, which you you probably feel like it's the right time in your life, you reached out to get pre-approved. The lender went through it and said, yes, you are pre-approved. By all means, the earlier you can do this in life. I mean, think about this. You're 28, single mom with one child. You'll be 58. And if you just make the monthly payments, you've fixed your housing costs for the next 30 years and it'll be paid off at 58 before you even retire. Your kid will have grown up with the stability of of a house and school district and same friends throughout their entire childhood. So there's so much good that can come from that. Um, As long as all of all of the groundwork has been laid, you would absolutely want to do that. The big thing to me is is fixing your housing cost in 30 years with 3% rent uh, appreciation. People have a hard time wrapping their mind around this, but $2,000 rents are going to be $4,000. Your $300,000 home, even with a minimal down payment in a high tax state, is going to be less than that. And you should have one or multiple opportunities to refinance to a lower rate over that next 30 years. So my my answer with what little we know here is, is 100% yes. What are your thoughts, Jeff? I, I think you nailed it. Uh, and the only thing I would add to that is, is what I say all the time. You're comfortable with the payment, right? You have some money in the bank in case something does happen just for for safekeeping, so to speak. Do you have a little bit longer time horizon? That's the house you're going to be in for the next five, seven, 10 years. Those are all important things to, you know, is that house going to allow you to grow into it over the next five, seven, 10 years? Is it going to be enough property for where you are in your life and where you see yourself? If the answer to all of those is yes, then I don't see any reason why you would wait. Um, but to each his own, you have to make that decision. We cannot answer that for you. Uh, right. Uh, Luis says, uh, always good stuff. Keep up the great work. Appreciate it. Appreciate you being here. Uh, let's see here. We had a couple others, Josh. Um, you know, so somebody asked a question earlier, they asked it twice. I didn't answer it because it's a difficult question to answer, but it just says, is it too risky to buy expensive property right now? I don't even know what that means. Um, what's expensive? Is it expensive because you think it's expensive or is it expensive because it's a $5 million property? I mean, you know, it's to each his own when it comes to using, um, you know, uh, adjectives like expensive and and that sort of thing, right? Well, even that, Jeff, if it's a $5 million home, is it risky to who? If Mark yeah. Wahlberg wants to buy a $5 million home, it's a rounding error. He doesn't even miss the money in his bank account. That's if I sad. go buy it, that that's risky. That, you know, when you say things like that, it just makes like that's sad that really like there are people out there when like that's a rounding error. It really is. <laughs> like, But to, to get back to the question here, uh, you know, it, it, it is exactly the conversation we just had with Kayla. It is all of the things that we just talked about. Where are you in your life financially, job stability, relationship stability, money in the bank? All of the thing, time horizon, all of those things are where you should be focused on when asking that question. If the answer to all of those is a solid and, um, you know, is a solid answer and a resounding yes, and it's a foundation there, then absolutely. If the answer is no, then no. The answer is no. Um, it is that simple. Uh, Josh, Sandy asked another question about HOA. So a lot of people crap on HOAs. Um, and I get it. There's a lot of horror stories when it comes to HOAs. Uh, they're not for everyone. Uh, but the question here is, is asking about condos and HOAs and, and, and along the lines of, are there any downsides, long-term downsides to buying a condo or condo still a long, a good long-term investment? I don't think there's anything wrong with buying condos. As long as you're buying into a community that is well-kept, they have good reserves, you know, the the budget, like everything in the property when it comes to the financials is stable. If you're buying into a community that doesn't have that, they have a history of HOA dues continuing to go up every single year, their budget's being mismanaged, they don't have money in reserves, then the answer is an absolutely never, do not buy it. Um, on the flip side, you can kind of have a, a an in-between. I don't think there's anything wrong with condos. Um, they are a good, a great stepping stone for for some people. Uh, to to the next leg, and they are a, a great permanent residence for other people who plan to live in them forever, just depending on what you're buying. So um, it, it always goes down to location, comes down to location. So make sure you're still focusing, even though it's a condo, you're thinking about location, thinking about you know um, who the next buyer is, that sort of thing, and 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 does it work in your life? That's that's really it. I wouldn't 
wouldn't get bogged down in, in other people's opinions of, uh, of that sort of thing. But what I will say is, is they do, they don't appreciate at a rate equivalent to a single family home in most cases. Um, during the pandemic it was a little bit different just because there was a lack of everything out there. Um, and, and, and condos are typically less expensive. Now they can be more, but typically less. And so, because, you know, housing affordability is out of whack and people budgets are out of whack. The, the properties that were less expensive were the condos and therefore they were getting the bids and the multiple offers and the appreciation just like single family homes. So it can go both ways. In Jeb, in episode 18 of the podcast back in 2022, we did an entire episode of single family versus a condo. So if you wanted to listen to 30 minutes versus two or three minute summary of, of Jeb giving you the info on that, we really went in, in detail on that. And I believe there's actually a second one uh, in there. I think we did two episodes on it, but episode 18, definitely go check that one out. And here's what I want to say. When Josh just threw that out there, understand episode 18, we were still figuring out. The <laughs> we've, we've improved considerably since episode 18. We're on episode 106. That's what we filmed today. Episode 106, people. It's a lot of episodes. Uh, that is two years of literally recording at least once a week. Sometimes we did twice. Um, and, uh, yeah, a lot, a lot of stuff, a lot of good content out there for you guys to consume. If you haven't done so already, head over to the Educated Home Buyer podcast on YouTube, like and subscribe, follow the content. Uh, we drop episodes every Tuesday on the podcast as well as YouTube. If you like to listen to audio, you know, maybe you're catching this, which we put on the podcast every Friday. So we actually take this show. This is our Friday show on the podcast. You guys don't need to listen to it because you're here, but maybe you want to listen to it. Otherwise, every Tuesday is a new episode for you. It's a 30, 40 minute dive into a topic. It's not bouncing around like this. So do yourself a favor. Get educated. Uh, Josh, we are. How long have we been doing this, dude? 56 minutes. 56 minutes. Holy cow. Uh, all right. Uh, let's see what we have. Um, Josh. We had a couple of, of simple ones. Hold here. on. I, I want to jump on this real quick before we do that, Josh. Okay. Uh, Kayla, following up. Going to be honest, I don't have a savings. The house only seems right because houses are going so fast, and I'm not sure if it will be this low again. Is real estate always about taking a risk? No. I mean, there are times when it's always going to be uncomfortable. It's like anything. Change is uncomfortable. Um, but I would say don't put yourself in a financial position that you're not comfortable with just because you feel like you're going to miss out on an opportunity, the whole FOMO thing, because it could work out, but it also could not work out. So I'm not saying it's not the right move for you because it could very well be, but you just need to, to understand where you are and be comfortable with that. Like what is the mortgage payment compared to what you would rent? Is it even close? If the number's close, then it's a, I mean, it's still probably a yes, but you got to make that decision. Josh? That was exactly what I was going to say, Jeb, is most parts of the country, it is more expensive to own than rent right now. And most parts significantly so. So if we don't have savings, if we're not able to save now, and we're looking at a higher housing payment, it's risky. That's risky. Um, and only you can determine, is it worth it? Um, you know, over time, it gets better, but like you're risking your credit. You're risking, you know, that's a traumatic experience for you. If you were to lose the home, it's a traumatic experience for a child to lose their home. Ask all of the, the kids that are now coming into prime home buying age who their parents lost their homes in 2007, 2008, 2009. Um, it's really hard to say in the context of the show here, but home ownership is really important. You should do everything possible to make it happen. Everything possible except taking on excess risk and only you can measure that and we can't answer it in the context of the show here good good um let's see josh you were, you had one on the screen i think you had clicked on one and i yeah called it omar off. quick quick question best type of loan for triplex investment outside of california will not be living in any of them any suggestions so non-owner um you just eliminated fha va usda so you're talking fannie freddie or a portfolio loan most likely Fannie Freddie is going to have the best terms, but you would want to check in many parts of the country, local banks and credit unions still loan their own money and set their own guidelines. For us in, in big metropolitan areas, you get the big national banks and they're not doing anything outside of the norm. So most likely that's going to be a Fannie Freddie loan. That would be uh, what you end up looking at. 
All right. Jonathan has a question here that's been sitting here for a little bit too, uh, saying that he owns a home in California. will be buying a house in Texas in about five months. If I apply for a home equity line of credit on my current home in California, will it have a negative impact on the pre-approval for the new mortgage in Texas? So Josh, let's, let's answer that. Applying for, for the HELOC, no, but getting a HELOC and borrowing from it, yeah. So even if you got the HELOC, you apply and you get it, but you leave it there. It's just there just because. Um, so with that, then it has no impact. But if you borrow $10,000 or $100,000 on it, or if you're going to use it for your down payment, it absolutely is going to impact your qualifications. You need to check with your mortgage professional and make sure it doesn't invalidate your pre-approval. Good stuff. Uh, love for puppies. Congrats on subscribers. Appreciate it. Um, for those of you who are just here, hit 100,000 because of you and very grateful for that. Uh, we've been on the show an hour tonight. want to ask that you like and subscribe if you haven't done so already. Uh, if you're not listening to the podcast, The Educated Home Buyer, you're doing yourself a disservice. If you show up here every single week, honestly, and you ask questions and you listen to the content, and you're not doing that, you really are doing yourself a disservice because that information is better in many ways because it's a deeper dive into a topic that can really get you the answers that you need to know versus the answers that sometimes you want to know. Um, so go over there, like, subscribe, listen to the stuff. I'm telling you, it is it is good content. It's taken me a long time to feel comfortable, guys, to tell you how good the content is and not because I put it out because it's almost like imposter syndrome to some extent saying that I feel like I'm, I'm, I feel uneasy talking about how good I think some of this stuff is. It's good stuff. It's what you need to know. I often tell Josh all the time, you know, the videos that do the best on YouTube are the videos that are garbage for the most part. The videos that people really need to know the information that would benefit them in so many ways don't get nearly as many likes, don't get nearly as many um, you know, comments or thumbs up or whatever, or views rather. It's the it's the other stuff that gets the views and and it's the fear stuff. This stuff is really guiding you through the process. So check it out. Um, we're still at six, we're just over six, Josh. Let's answer a couple more, keep it kind of going along. Um uh, Jim, let's just there's there's a, a, a comment here so kayla came back and said that her rent is is 1500 the mortgage will be 2400 i think you guys have helped me make the answer clear i greatly appreciate it and another viewer here actually had an interesting thought kayla have you thought about renting a room to a trustworthy person there's potential there we have a lot of young buyers that in and, and kayla's young in her 20s that home ownership is important and they say well, hey, yeah, if I bought a three bedroom house, a room can rent for eight or nine hundred dollars and it makes it equivalent to what my rent is. But there's a lot with that. You just say, I'm raising a kid. Do I have someone trustworthy that I'm comfortable living and sharing a house with? There are options. There are things there to consider. I wouldn't say give up on it, but I would say, what can we do to raise our income, to build up some savings? Can we get someone that would would uh, be able to buy with it? Can you is, is there someone that, that you know, another single mom that would like to buy a duplex and each of you live on either side? It doesn't mean it's a dead end. It just means, hey, we probably need to think harder and and before jumping into something too risky. There you go. Uh, Matthew has a quick question here. It says, been watching a lot of your FHA loan videos and was wondering how an, a three point half three and a half percent down payment will affect the monthly mortgage. So anytime you put less than than you know, less money down, doesn't matter if it's three and a half percent, five percent, whenever you're comparing it to a 20 percent down or a 10 percent down, it's going to affect you with a higher monthly payment. Um, the nice thing about FHA uh, is that, you know, if you're putting three and a half percent down, putting five percent down, maybe putting a little bit more down, very little difference in the in the rate, um, d depending on where your credit score is. So, you know, you're not going to get a huge jump by putting more money down with an FHA loan. Um, the downside, if you will, is, is, you know, the upfront mortgage insurance premium when it comes to FHA, you're going to lose essentially part of that equity, that three and a half percent down payment that you have because you're financing 1.75% back into the loan amount. So that's the biggest risk I think is if you have a shorter term time horizon, not gaining the appreciation, having to sell that property, having very little equity in it, that's really the biggest risk outside of that. It, 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 
the benefits are that it allows you to buy a home with a minimal down payment. Uh, it gives you pretty close to the best rates out there in the market uh, when it comes to what's allowed uh, or what's available rather on a 30-year fixed mortgage. FHA is very competitive uh, on that side. Even when you add the mortgage insurance premium onto it, um, in most cases, depending on your credit score, it's still worth it. So it's, it, it's, it's, a, it's an option. So if you're talking about putting 3% down doing conventional or 3.5% down doing conventional versus FHA, have your lender run side-by-side -side comparisons and you see which ones fits your, what you're comfortable with. And if you need that, that lender referral, there's a link scroll at the bottom. Josh, anything you want to add to that? No, other than sort of the, the other idea is most people don't have a big down payment. So it's not, Hey, would I do a three and a half percent down FHA or am I going to put 20% down? So if we're talking about, do I buy now with a three and a half percent down FHA or do I wait four years so I can save five or 10% down? then by all means, FHA is a very good program. If you have both amounts, we want to sit and, and compare them. It's been a big question. Jay. We had a couple of questions last week of people saying, why would I do that? Why would I put 20% down when I can get a lower interest rate uh, on, on an FHA? And we actually have a, a question here that follows up on that. Love for Puppy says, why do some lenders have similar FHA and conventional rates while others have a bigger spread between FHA and conventional rates? So earlier in the show, someone asked, uh, am I going to get a better deal from a, a broker? The lenders who have similar FHA and conventional loans are generally non-bank lenders. So they're mortgage companies with big lines of credit that make loans in their own name, and they use their government loans to subsidize the conventional. So they have high margins, they're expensive loans. It just, it is, it is what it is. So if you are looking at a government loan and you haven't spoken with a broker, you are doing yourself a disservice because it's going to be anywhere from a quarter to three quarters of a percent lower than what you're getting from a bank or a non-bank lender. All right. Good stuff. Uh, post this comment. Maurice, uh, gentlemen, we helped last year buy a house uh, here locally. Um, you guys are awesome. My Avengers. So Maurice, appreciate you taking the time to drop in here. Uh, probably just scrolling through YouTube and seeing us. But either way, you know, it's it's been, I don't know how long it's been. Maybe a year? Nah, maybe not a year. A little less. Either, a little less. Uh, but sometime last year bought a house. So congrats to you on that. Um, Josh, where are we? We're at six oh six seven one oh seven. We've been on an hour and seven minutes. So that's where we're gonna end it tonight, guys. We we'll back next Wednesday, 5 p.m. live here on uh my channel and the Educated Home Buyer podcast channel to answer your questions, update you on the economy. Not really gonna have a lot of data between now and then. Um, so come with your questions, we'll get you taken care of. But if you need a lender, real estate agent anywhere in the country that can guide you through the process. That link below will get you to someone. And on top of that, if you haven't done so already, like and subscribe here, leave us a comment, rate us, review us, call us, give us high fives, give us namaste, <laughs> whatever. Namaste. <laughs> uh, until next time, guys. Adios.